I'm Tom Thurston uh, with the Gilder Lamron Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Today, we're going to be hearing from Anibal Arocho, who is uh, the, uh, well, I'm not going to introduce him. I'm going to let Martha introduce him. Marta, <laughs> Marta Moret, uh, and I'll have you say more about yourself. But you know, I met Marta a couple years ago when she graciously uh, uh, let us use uh, her and her husband's house to entertain a group of teachers from Sierra Leone, which is a really special thing for anyone to do, but very special if it's the president of Yale University. <laughs> and uh, I can't say how, how much that meant to uh, all of us, uh, both here in Connecticut and in Sierra Leone. It was a great way to kind of start off what was a fantastic 10 days uh, working with teachers uh, there. And uh, again, I want to thank you so much for that. Well, thank you, Thomas. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, it was a, a few years ago that this happened, and I, I remember absolutely falling in love with the Gilder Learman Center, and I kept saying to Peter, do you think I could start graduate school all over again? I'd, I'd love to. So it, this has been you know, a marriage made in heaven. Hopefully, it, when COVID is over, many more things were, would be done. Actually, Anibal, if COVID were not here, we would be having a nice little dinner for you at the president's house. So Lovely. <laughs> sorry, we can't do that. You guys owe me one. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, welcome. Buenas tardes. As you probably already know, my name is Marta Elisa Moret. That's the full name. I'm a New Yorican from Banana Kelly in the South Bronx and part of the mainland diaspora that makes up the island of Puerto Rico, uh, where my mother grew up in a small, barely surviving finca or farm, and she had 13 brothers and sisters. My father was on the other side of the central mountains, living in one of the poorest neighborhoods in San Juan. And in the 40s, my mother uh, went to New York to work in the garment district. And during um, a famous uh, operation bootstrap on the island that Truman was responsible for, and changed uh, uh, in the history, changed uh, the lives of a lot of uh, Puerto Rican women. And I often talk about it in my class on maternal and child health. Um, my dad uh, also came to New York and he joined the Merchant Marines. The rest is a noisy, musical, food-filled life, not in New York because we were there for only a few years, but up in New Milford, Connecticut, which is the land of, um, well, if you've been to the Northwest section of Connecticut, you don't see many Puerto Ricans, but we were the only family there other than my best friend, Quinton Kwame, who were the second uh, family of color um, in that, in that uh, area. Um, oh, and I'm sure you know this, but I am actually proudly the very first Puerto Rican First Lady of Yale. So that's pretty good. <laughs> um, as an, an epidemiologist, I've devoted nearly 40 years of uh, teaching and research on the public health issues affecting Latinos. I've also worked with African American families and with Native American families in the United States. And it's because of our shared background and our commitments to the improvement of scholarship around Latino issues and Spanish language issues that I am both delighted and very honored to introduce Anibel Arrocho. Mr. Arrocho is a native of Hell's Kitchen, New York, so sort of within spitting distance of Banana Republic, not too close, and the, son, the proud son of bodega owners. Uh, since 2015, Mr. Arrocho coordinates the resources and services available at the Centro Library and Archives at Hunter College. He actually holds an MS in Library and Information Sciences from the Pratt Institute. Um, and as the library manager, he supervises library staff, operations, and services. But his main areas of expertise include the following. He curates resources targeting Puerto Rican studies, uh, the communities of Puerto Ricans at the national level with a focus of a specialty he has on Spanish archives. 
He creates indexes and catalogs bibliographic, multimedia, and digital resources. He provides research consultation and follow-up requests, not only in person, but by phone and by email. Um, and the most important thing to me that I loved in his bio is that, like me, I am intensely committed and dedicated to my students because I think they're the future of the world. And he is intensely committed and dedicated to his library staff as a future scholars of the world. So in addition to having gotten his MS from Pratt Institute, he uh, got his Bachelor of Arts in English Education with a focus on technology and multimedia studies at the Universidad de Puerto Rico, which is a wonderful place. Um, he also uh, serves on the executive board of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, and he is president and the founding member of the English Student Association. So I want to welcome you, Anibal, to Yale University and especially to Gilder Learman and everybody in the audience, please welcome, give a warm welcome to Anibal Arrocho. Anibal, do you want to add anything to that very flattering uh, uh, bio? I know I'm I'm feeling a, a little flushed. Um, <laughs> uh, no, you guys you guys definitely covered it uh, and then some. So uh, I'm just uh, happy to be here today uh, and happy to share a little bit of my knowledge. And uh, um, I want everyone to know. And the, the main thing that they can take away is that Simpro is is here for you, no matter uh, what day. You know, is email or reach out, and we'll be here to to provide and facilitate resources. I know I've taken advantage of the resources there uh, uh, several times. I've, I've brought uh, New Haven students who are part of the LEAP program here uh, to come down for the summer to visit there. Uh, they just love the place. And what really struck me was just uh, for, you know, now the, uh, the public school population here in New Haven is, uh, is uh, over 50%, I believe, a Latino, uh, uh, largely Puerto Rican, but also from the DR and other places. But you know, just the kind of um, uh, excitement they had to be uh, told a little about about their history and to hear uh, places and uh, and people that they'd heard about and, and known about and learned so much. Uh, when the state of Connecticut started up the uh, this program to teach uh, Black and Latino history in the high schools, you know, it made me realize uh, first of all what a wonderful opportunity that was. But then, you know, how little uh, many of us in teaching uh, know about uh, either of those subjects. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of work in African American history, but I must say that there's much about uh, Latino history, Puerto Rican history that I, I just know just the barest amount, and it's so important because even. And, and Marta and you uh, talking about just your brief bio. I mean, you see how uh, connected uh, policies of the mainland United States are with what is happening all the time in, um, in Puerto Rico. And I wonder, um, uh, Anibal, Marta, could you say a little about what is the relationship uh, politically of Puerto Rico uh, to the United States. I mean, you hear so many different kind of ways of, of defining it. Could, could you kind of get that very contentious sometimes conversation rolling? <laughs> well, yeah, um, it's, it is definitely a complicated relationship. Um, the, legal, the legal terminology is that Puerto Rico is an unincorporated territory of the United States, and it is a self-governing uh, unincorporated territory of the United States, and, and as such is classified as a commonwealth uh, by the United Nations. Um, but in, in so few words, it is probably one of the last remaining colonies that is occupied by, by the United States. Um, and so the political relationship is that Puerto Ricans are, are citizens uh, at birth, um, but uh, Puerto Rican citizens, uh, uh, United, uh, although they are United States citizens, they cannot vote uh, for US elected officials. Um, if they move to the states uh, and they establish residency in the states, they can then vote in elections. Um, Puerto Ricans, in terms of uh, taxes, they pay payroll tax and social security tax. So in many ways, they're, they're taxed and they don't have the representation of their uh, counterparts on the, in, in the states. 
What's interesting as well, um, Anibal, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, in terms of the health and social services that are given to Puerto Ricans on the island, that is purely at the discretion of the United States. It's like a, we do block grants in, in our states where uh, the maternal and child health block, block grants, you go to the to the Connecticut legislature and you plead your case and you get a portion of the block grant that is sent to Connecticut from the federal government. The same thing applies to the island of Puerto Rico and it can be a very, it is never enough and it's never on time. And uh, it creates, uh, when Hurricane Maria was there, it was created a multitude of problems. So, so it's a very tricky relationship. Yeah, the disparity in, in terms of like uh, things like Medicare funding and and uh, FEMA funding and like you mentioned, the, the reaction time and, and the, the facilitation of those funds to the island is something that's always called, called into question. Um, and, uh, you know, part of part of the relationship between Puerto Rico and, and uh, the United States is that uh, Puerto Ricans can travel freely to the states and also to Puerto Rico. So you, so you do have a very long history of of migration, the entire 20th century, um, you have a history of migration, and and as the generations uh, went on, you had a history of return migration as well. And you know, I know there's been a lot of conversation uh, recently about statehood for DC and also Puerto Rico, uh, and you know, with people salivating that maybe that'll mean more democratic senators. But statehood for Puerto Rico is a bit of a contested issue, isn't it? <laughs> At least among Puerto Ricans. <laughs> Uh, it's probably the most contested issue. Um, uh, it's it's it, it, it's really a loaded uh, conversation. Um, there's a lot that goes into the statehood conversation. Um, the, 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 the main crux of the issue is that Puerto Ricans have really never been given the opportunity to decide for themselves in any sort of real meaningful um, binding way. Um, so, you know, there's lots of people that think that they're being allies to Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans in the diaspora by saying, well, you know, Puerto Rico should be uh, the, you know, the 51st or 52nd state. Um, but what they should really do, and if they consider some, themselves allies, is, is to um, uh, strive and support Puerto Rico's self-determination. Absolutely. It's really interesting because the, the, the beginning of Puerto Rico with its relationship with the United States was a deal that was cut during the Spanish-American War, right? That's Anibal? correct, yep. And, and the, uh, the United States has always seen Puerto Rico as, you know, instead of going to all these countries in Europe and, and doing trade and getting the things that you need, why not turn Puerto Rico into, move it from an agricultural society into more of an industrial society where they can without, without uh, the issues related to regulation could do, you know, create drugs and, um, and uh, do all kinds of manufacturing opportunities that would then allow the United States to go to Puerto Rico in a very short trip and do the kind of things that they, so it's almost like Puerto Rico was uh, maybe like a, a Google or an Amazon that created a, an island where some of its best uh, uh, produce were created, and they could and they could get them that way. So the relationship has never been a very equal one, and um, and I think that that's that's the the the, um, the bulk of the of the tension that's existed. You make a very good point in in the fact that. Um many of the United States industry, um, you know, for, and, and in the beginning of the 20th century was, was based on experimenting in Puerto Rican markets uh, first, uh, in, including many of our, you know, the labor union, labor leaders, they, their policies, they would try to implement them first in early 20th century Puerto Rico working conditions, and then get support and then export those sort of policies back uh, to the states. Right. Um, so there's there's a rich history of that of that sort of, of of interchange as well. So one of the ways that they did this was um, when I say they uh, they had almost no regulations for the factories that were producing chemicals and all of that. 
they polluted waters, which resulted in all kinds of uh, environmental and physical problems with children being born that were much more, their bodies were much more mature than, than they should have been for that age. That's never really been fully resolved. Um, you know, and Operation Bootstrap was really the beginning of all of that. And that's the area that as a public health person, I am especially interested in because uh, in changing the economy from an agrarian economy into a more industrial economy. They tried to get all of the workers off of the fincas into factories, into business, and they gave them salaries that were only slightly higher than they would have made as farm workers, but was enough to get them out. They moved all the women out of the cottage industry, promising them money and childcare. They did free examinations that resulted in um, OBGYN examinations that resulted in always finding something and always curing it and always resulting in the sterilization of Puerto Rican women. So now we have something like 38 to 39% of women that were sterilized. My own mother, when she came from Puerto Rico to New York had uh, two children. And when um, my brother was born, the doctor told her she was too small to have children and he would take care of that. And so she was sterilized. And I remember sitting at the table as a young girl, listening to my mother and my aunts talking about La Operacion that resulted in sterilization, un unknown unwanted sterilization of women. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the legacies that, that we have to make sure that people don't forget. Um, yes. La Operacion is, is something that is still spoken about in families and, and across generations. Um, and it's important that people, you know, in their teens now understand that this is something that happened not all that long ago. Um, and with reference to Operation Bootstrap, it, it really was an effort by the United States government to sort of modernize uh, Puerto Rican industry. But at the same time, the, the Puerto Rican government at the time was doing everything in their power to try to encourage as many Puerto Rican people to move to the states to lessen the burden, the financial burden on the island. So that's when you have that out migration that, that, that you know, the giant, uh, gigantic wave of out migration that, that we're all familiar with. Wasn't that called the Tiger Marine and Pan Am? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. So the, mari the Marine Tiger, that's, the, the, that's one of the Marine steamships <laughs> that, was, that was used um, uh, prior to World War II. And then after World War II, um, uh, you know, Pan Am Airways and, uh, <laughs> And they're just getting people that are very early. We have in our archive very early photos of people sitting in beach chairs on, on propeller planes. These were the first people that, that made that trip. Yeah, I think that a lot of times, um, you know, with, uh, uh, with introducing uh, uh, Puerto Rican and, and Latino studies into the curriculum, people say, you know, treat it as benefiting those students here in New Haven that. But really, I think just from this, the short conversation, you can't really understand the history of the United States without understanding the history that it has with Puerto Rico. I mean, so much, um, you know, just thinking about the, the political and, and economic history of the United States, it targets so carefully, so closely with, you know, its relationship with Puerto Rico that really you're left kind of uh, not knowing the full picture without understanding uh, this relationship. And what's really interesting too is that I don't think in the United States we have a, f a really full understanding of where Puerto Ricans fit vis-a-vis -vis Cubans, Mexicans, South Americans. I mean, when, um, when I was a, a deputy commissioner in the state of Connecticut, I went to testify for a maternal and child care block grant. And, um, one of the Republican legislators said to me, um, you know, I, I just want you to hurry up and give this testimony because I want you, you people need to go back to your, to, you know, where you came from, you know, you don't even belong here. And I said, well, actually I am a citizen of the United States and all Puerto Ricans are, so we definitely belong here. And the idea that a legislator in a state like Connecticut would not recognize that is not, that unusual. I think the misconceptions, correct on about, of what a Puerto Rican is, is really, and our history and all of that is really, um, is really interesting.
Yeah. Um, there's uh, obviously there's no short there's no shortage of of struggle and no shortage of disparaging remarks that have been made uh, regarding Puerto Ricans and and the plight of Puerto Ricans. Like we don't need to look that far back to see the way that our leaders have treated the people of Puerto Rico um, and how uh, our constituent uh, the Puerto Rican represent um, the represent the people the politicians that represent Puerto Rico and the Puerto Ricans in the diaspora. Uh, so often rely on them for their votes, but then are uh, deaf to the needs of the Puerto Rican communities. Right. Why not throw a paper towel at the crowd when as a solution to what's going on with the hurricane, right? Certainly. Listen, uh, why don't we con continue this conversation by, but by way of uh, Anibal, you kind of introducing us to the uh, resources uh, at, at, at uh, Central. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, just a little bit of a background information. Uh, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, it's a research institute that is um, located at Hunter College at the City University of New York. Um, our facilities are located at 119th Street and 3rd Avenue in East Harlem. Um, and we have all sorts of wonderful programming and resources. And I'm going to share some of that with you in a slideshow I put together uh, for this presentation. So um, Centro is uh, very close to celebrating its 50th anniversary. We're just uh, two years and uh, we're already desperately planning to see what, what sort of big splash we're gonna make with our uh, 50th anniversary. Um, but the archive itself um, has been around for 32 years, uh, established uh, for 32 years. And originally um, our library started as a, as a reading room um, with you know a few chairs and and uh, one one professional librarian and and the archives came as a result of the work that was done by a lot of the research associates um, and um, faculty members of Hunter College uh, as they would come across individuals in the community that people would come to them and and go hey you know I have this box of papers of of old photographs of us you know when we came on a steamship and. Um, and, and basically people started accumulating like any archive, it starts with, you know, a box on a shelf. And over the course of many, uh, at this point, decades, uh, we've accumulated over 300 collections and our holdings uh, are in the tens of thousands of linear feet to the point where we have uh, external storage facilities uh, in facilities such as Iron Mountain. Um, and... Uh, let's start with a few historical facts about Puerto Rico and uh, Puerto Rican stateside. This, uh, a lot of people might be familiar with this photograph. Uh, it's from 1977. Uh, it's a group of 30 or so uh, Puerto Rican protesters. They were protesting uh, for the release of the, the individuals that carried out the shooting uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives. And uh, something that's always interesting to me regarding this, this photo is that when they interviewed the security guard at um, the Statue of Liberty said, if there is such a thing as being a pleasure to work with, these protesters were, he said. So even, even when they're protesting and taking over the Statue of Liberty, the Puerto Ricans are very kind and very hospitable. Um, so P Puerto Rico is comparable to Connecticut, uh, bigger than Delaware and Rhode Island uh, put together. It's comparable to Connecticut in terms of the land mass and also in, in terms of the population. Um, we're the second largest Latino group in the United States with uh, 5.5 million Puerto Ricans living stateside and 3.3 in Puerto Rico. Um, that's changed uh, significantly due to things such as the earthquakes and Hurricane Maria and uh, fiscal crises. Um, in 1493, uh, Puerto Rico became a Spanish colony. Uh, as a result of the Spanish-American War, it became a US territory. Uh, in 1917, the United States Congress granted a, a US citizenship um, but it was it was uh, conditional citizenship, um, and uh, actual birthright citizenship was not granted until 1940. Um, at that time, in 1917, uh, that was the signing of the Jones Act, um, and uh, it provided that sort of statutory citizenship. Um, uh, we start we begin to see the Puerto Rican communities in the 1920s in Brooklyn. Uh, Manhattan, uh, Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, Chelsea, and the Lower East Side. These were the, the first, the first sort of Puerto Rican enclaves. 
Um, and then we see in the 1940s, those great migrations that like we had mentioned earlier due to um, the Puerto Rican government encouraging people to travel uh, due to op Operation Bootstrap. Um, and then we, we begin to see the return migration uh, of Puerto Ricans who have established themselves and wanted uh, and, and longed to be back home. Uh, and so a lot of them buy property or return to family, historical family properties and lands and go and live. Um, and we uh, have six Puerto Ricans serving in the US Congress. I believe Jose Serrano has, has retired, um, but Nidia Velasquez, Luis Gutierrez, Raul Labrador, Darren Soto, Antonio Delgado, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. In terms of representatives, um, a Puerto Rican representative from Puerto Rico, um, there is one uh, non-voting delegate. Uh, her name is Jennifer Gonzalez. Um, she cannot vote on any sort of legislation. Um, but she is allowed to sit on committees. Um, so Centro is celebrating 48 years. Um, we were established uh, by Frank Bonilla. Um, it was established as a, as, a, as a means to give a voice to scholars and a community that felt that um, the university system was underrepresenting uh, Puerto Rican struggle and Puerto Rican experience. Um, we wanted to make sure that our culture was preserved and disseminated in a way that was equal to other uh, ethnic groups. Puerto Rico has always been in the minds of uh, Americans. Um, you can see here some, image, some images uh, from uh, various parts of our archives and different clips from microfilms that we have. Um, you can see that one of Uncle Sam sort of devouring Puerto Rico and Cuba. Um, the, the same things that we always see is, is Puerto Ricans constantly having to be reaffirmed as, you know, part of the United States that that has never really changed. Um, and uh, one of the early uh, resources that Centro put out um, were oral history projects. Uh, we had one called Early Puerto Rican Migrants, uh, or our Pioneros, which uh, came from a collection by the of uh, from a gentleman by the name of Jesus Colon. Um, Jesus and his brother arrived in the United States as workers on steamships. Um, so if we have some of the most comprehensive uh, for a primary source documentation of early Puerto Rican migration, we're talking here, here around the 1920s. And then another one, oral history project that, that was produced by Centro was uh, one on women in the garment industry, which was done as a sort of radio program by Hunter College. Again, this is another resource that is available in our library. We have uh, since digitized these so people um, can listen to them. These are uh, some of the books that were produced using some of the resources. Um, uh, some of the topics that are very popular among scholars are labor, uh, migration, uh, bilingual education, uh, political empowerment. Um, our library, although we are part of Hunter College, our library and archives is open to the community. Um, we never charge for any of our services, um, nor do we plan to charge for any of our services. And we uh, help people uh, from middle schoolers, as uh, you know, as Tom has, Tom has brought us groups of middle schoolers in the past, um, uh, Hunter College undergrad students, um, independent scholars working on, on books, uh, documentary filmmakers, um, even uh, members of Congress reach out to us from time to time for research about Puerto Rico. Um, we have several research resources, including over 18,000 books uh, relating to Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rican studies. Uh, we make a conscious effort to collect um, thesis, thesis and dissertations um, these are works, um, scholarly works that are produced by PhD students um, that in many cases uh, might not actually make it as, as published books, um, but nonetheless, the scholarship is very vital and uh, we believe that's an important resource to have and it covers a lot of a lot more uh, esoteric subject material um, than normally published books. Uh, we have over 500 periodicals and journals, including uh, a, an expansive collection of Putter, early Puerto Rican publications on microfilm. Uh, newspapers such as uh, El Imparcial, La Democracia, um, and also um, span uh, newspapers that were pr produced uh, during the Spanish colonial times. Um, 
such as uh, El Boletín Mercantil, which was a, a, a business paper that was produced around the 18, early 1890s. Um, we also have over 600 films, which we do lend um, to teachers, uh, again, free of charge. Uh, we have a DVD, we still have a lot on VHS, um, and we have an online bibliography that people can log on to if they wanna uh, just get a quick reading list of different subjects, uh, uh, links to articles, uh, about a variety of different topics. And Centro as a whole, um, we've got our we've got our finger in a lot of in a lot of different cookie jars. So we produce video programming, in uh, including documentaries and and television. We have a television series that's available on Vimeo. Um, we have uh, Centro Press that produces the peer reviewed Centro Journal. Um, we have uh, we've uh, since COVID, we've pivoted to virtual events, um, but there there is uh, virtual film screenings. So one is being held tonight, um, and we have uh, a cultural ambassador program that um, hopes to teach um, Puerto Ricans of all ages and interests um, about their own culture and history, including cultural ambassadors junior for kindergarten age uh, students. Oh. Um, the idea is that we want to sort of meet um, people interested. In, in Puerto Rican culture and history where they're at. So it's, it's not our job to be prescriptive about how uh, people use our materials or judge how people use our materials. We just have to provide lots of different resources uh, of, of a variety of different types so that people can feel comfortable using our material. Um, the, the first uh, iteration of the archive was called the Archives of the Puerto Rican Diaspora. And here you can see some images uh, from that Jesus Colon collection, as I mentioned, um, his U.S. Customs Service card, uh, cabin luggage tags. We have passenger lists and manifests from um, the USS Cuamo and the Borinquen. These were steamships that were used prior to World War II to transport Puerto Ricans from the island to New York. Um, and in many cases, um, uh, we have menus and other ephemera uh, to, so you can actually get a sense of what it was like to travel under these conditions. Uh, and then we do have documentation also of uh, what it was like to early airplane travel. These are the, the beach chair, the lawn chairs inside of a propel <laughs> propeller plane. Um, uh, this is before more strict uh, federal regulations. Uh, our archive has over 300 collections um, and it comprises over 5,000 cubic feet. Um, we've been collecting for over 32 years and uh, we have uh, some illustrious members in our archive, such as Pura Belpre, who was the first Puerto Rican librarian in the New York Public Library System. She was a storyteller and a children's book author. Um, we have the, the papers of Blaise Camacho Sosa, who is a, a, also a librarian. Um, but it's one of the biggest, um, I, guess, I would say, perspectives on Puerto Rican life in Hawaii that you can see, which is something very fascinating. Um, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that some of the very first Puerto Ricans that made it to the United States settled in San Francisco and Hawaii before they ever settled in New York. Um, and the reason they settled in San Francisco was because they would take them on, sh on a ship um, across the Gulf of Mexico, um, they would put them on a train uh, in Louisiana all the way to San Francisco. And by the end of that train ride, many Puerto Ricans didn't want to go any further. So they just left and stayed in San Francisco. Um, and then the other Puerto Ricans that, that, that would continue on would be put on steamships once again, and they would travel to Hawaii. And the reason that they would travel to Hawaii was because Puerto Ricans were seen as people that were very adaptable to the Hawaiian climate. They, you know, they said, oh, Puerto Rican Hawaii is very similar in terms of, of climate and vegetation. And they thought that Puerto Ricans would make better uh, employees and workers. And um, we have documentation. And, and in, in a lot of these photos, um, you get to see how Puerto Rican um, culture and Puerto Rican uh, celebrations uh, are sort of recreated in, in the Hawaiian environment. Um, we have lots of personal papers of, of uh, political figures. Uh, Felipe Torres, uh, Vito Macantonio, Herman Badillo. Um, 
and again, these are photos, these are uh, correspondence, uh, memoranda, um, you know, people's resumes, um, you know, personal personal letters, and 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 to us, we do have some um, objects as well. So we have presidential medals of freedom um, that was that were given to Antonia Pantoja, for instance. Uh, we have the organizational records of the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund, the United Bronx Parents, Aspira of New York, and of course we have our own organizational records for the history of Centro. Um, these were all organizations, uh, and I wanna say, especially Aspira and the United Bronx Parents that, that were community-based organizations that were striving for the betterment of the Puerto Rican community. Um, and a lot of times it, they, they weren't looking for, for any gigantic fundamental change. Um, they wanted their children to have adequate lunch in schools. They wanted their children to have adequate education in a language that they understood in schools. Um, so a lot of these early struggles uh, for bilingual education uh, occurred thanks to uh, Aspira and the United Bronx parents. Um, we have the one of the major collections we received in an agreement with um, the government of Puerto Rico is the OGPRIS papers, the Office of the Government of Puerto Rico in the United States. Um, this was a governmental office that was established within the United States to provide support services for Puerto Ricans that were migrating from Puerto Rico to the United States. Um, they, in many cases, they would provide the first identification that many of these Puerto Ricans would ever have so that they can rent apartments, open bank accounts, get driver's licenses. Um, so we have uh, all the applications for these identification cards from the Bureau of Employment and Identification. So uh, this is actually really interesting for genealogists uh, and people who want to learn about their parents' migration experience into the United States. And uh, you can see that the OGPRIS had uh, multiple regional offices, including one in Hartford. <coughs> you can see um, how uh, different, different other non, you know, one of the things is that people tend to think that we're very New York centric, but we have collections that document archival collections of uh, migration to the Northwest, Midwest, Florida, Hawaii, and uh, like I had mentioned, California, those Puerto Ricans that didn't want to go all the way to Hawaii. Um, we have an amazing collection of photographs from the Justo Marti collection. He was a Cuban photographer and he covered, he, he took photographs of early Puerto Rican communities. Um, and you can see people at uh, different theaters. You can read the marquees. You see children playing, people getting married and, and living their lives. Um, you can see John F. Kennedy campaigning in the Bronx. You can see the different coalitions that were starting to form between Puerto Rican communities and other ethnic communities. And we have over 2000 art and political posters, drawings and buttons in our flat files. Um, and we do have an art program as well. Um, we always like to use our reading room as a gallery. Um, so we, we encourage people when they bring students, they can appreciate the different uh, objects and art on our walls, in addition to the uh, library and archival material. Uh, our collection covers politics, government, and law. Uh, early, early Puerto Rican political candidates and also um, activist groups such as the Young Lords, which is very popular right now. Uh, we have the medals of um, Antonia Pantoja and we have the Presidential Citizens Medal of Helen Rodriguez Trias. Um, Antonio Pantoja was the founder of Aspira. Um, and you can see um, that we also, you, these are some of the more uh, uh, higher profile collections that we have in our collection. Uh, we have significant coverage in LGBTQ communities, including um, television programs called, and, and publications called Homo Visiones that document the, the development of the LGBTQ Puerto Rican community. Uh, we have collections that are relevant to Puerto Rican literary, uh, literary figures and the New Rican poetry movement. Uh, people such as Miguel Algarín, um, Tato Laviera, and Pedro Pietri. Um, we have a lot uh, interesting unpublished manuscripts. Um, and actually one of the very interesting ones was uh, the Victor, Farago Victor Faragoso was a playwright and uh, all of his um, plays were written in Spanish 
and uh, a scholar went and found his unpublished manuscripts in Spanish and released a book of uh, his published work in, uh, in a bilingual edition. So for the very first time, um, these works were available uh, to a much broader audience. Uh, and there's, there's a, one particular play about the Newark riots, which uh, gained a little bit of notoriety. And you can see the history of different struggles and, and activism um, for labor, uh, health. Um, you can see a picture of a protest against the movie Fort Apache, which is uh, was set, they were saying it's anti-Puerto Rican and anti-Black. It was a movie uh, about um, a, a police precinct in a, in a particularly dangerous part of the Bronx and it was called Fort Apache and it was a very poor representation of Blacks and Puerto Ricans at the time. And of course, um, a lot of the struggles that Puerto Ricans had to go through and these Puerto Rican communities had to go through in the 60s, 70s and 80s, um, this is not really changing. You know, there still is police brutality. There's still a health crisis. Um, so that's one of the sort of bridges that we can use um, to teach uh, sort of uh, contemporary issues and bridging it back to the, how these struggles originated in the past. And that's, that's sort of the magic of primary source documents is that you get, you know, ch you know, kids that are 14, 15 and 16 years old can understand that movements such as Black Lives Matter have their origins in the, these movements in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And uh, some more publications, uh, some recent publications, um, Borderline Citizens, um, Puerto Rican Citizen, the, the, the concept of citizenship is very important and, and a lot of recent um, work has been done, including an issue of the Central Journal Direct uh, um, that is dedicated solely to the topic of citizenship. We do all sorts of public programming, although these pictures make me a little sad because it reminds me of the pre-COVID times. Um, but uh, we have uh, pictures here of um, the Puerto Rican comic book, La Borinqueña, which was very popular. And we had a, a Puerto Rican comic book gallery uh, in our reading room. And we have all sorts of chalas and different events that are held at our facilities or were held and have since moved to virtual programming. We hope that in the not too distant future, we can move back to more in-person events. Um, and one of the most important developments in our um, archive is that we've begun to move a lot of our archive online. Um, and we were doing this back in 2015 uh, no one could have anticipated a, that a pandemic would strike and that our digital collection would be as more vital and important than ever. Um, but uh, we have an, a wonderful uh, system where we can digitize materials and put them online. Um, and I'll be showing you, uh, I'll be showing the, the audience um, that system in a little bit. Um, you can contact us. Um, I, I love receiving emails from educators about all sorts of topics. I love, my favorite things are recommending books, movies, and different resources. Uh, I like to, to leverage every uh, resource that Hunter College benefits me with. So all sorts of chapters from books and journal articles that I can facilitate. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and maybe one day uh, visit the, the campus and, and we can give you a tour of our facilities as well. And so now um, I'm going to show off a little bit of, of our digital collections. And uh, some more of our resources. Um, Tom or, or, or Martha, any, any questions or comments so far? I, I just want to um, let our audience know that if you have any questions about, uh, about uh, all of the resources that Anibal has been sharing, uh, feel free to uh, respond in the Q and A part, and we'll we'll get to them, you know, in a kind of way that doesn't interrupt the the uh, the program. Okay. My only comment is that th this is amazing. This is I didn't know that it had grown to this extent. So this is I'm I'm in awe. This is great. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we are we are uh, by by a significant margin the the most uh, comprehensive ethnic studies organization within the CUNY system, um, 
and we work very hard to try to grow that collection and, and grow those connections between our community and the way that they use our resources. And they're a short walk from the uh, 125th Street station for uh, those of you who want to think about taking a group down on the Metro North. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, our facilities are closed uh, due to COVID, but um, in, during normal times, yes, uh, we're very close to the 125th Street station. Lots of great restaurants in that area as well. Um, so we encourage people to come visit us. And you can see here that uh, we have uh, sort of some highlights of our virtual programming that we do. Um, this movie is, uh, is today, um, uh, this film screening, it's at 6 p.m. Sorry, you guys are gonna miss it, but it, it, it'll be saved. Um, so you can watch it at a later date. Um, but I really wanna share with you is um, our collections. So our collections is, is where you can locate our archival materials. And we have finding aids. Finding aids are tools that you can use um, to provide insight into what is within a, a collection, a, a, an individual's papers or an organization's records. Um, so you can see the different the alphabetical um, and you can see the different collections that are available, different individuals. Um, and they provide sort of biographic information along with an inventory of what is available within those collections. So for instance, we have one for Aspira and you can click through and you can see a sort of descriptive summary of, of Aspira. And we, we try to provide a fairly comprehensive organizational note. Um, in many cases, there are assignments that teachers create just using our finding aids as, as an educational resource without ever diving into the specifics of what is inside the material using these biographical notes and um, the, the descriptions and access points. Access points are the different subjects that are covered in every organization. So we have this for over 300 collections and we are migrating to a new system in the fall which should allow for keyword searching across different collections, which is a, a very powerful tool that we're really looking forward to sharing with everyone. Um, we have, uh, I'm gonna get to the digital collection is my favorite, so I'm gonna get to that one last. We have oral history collections, microfilm collections, um, research, different research resources and art programs. And um, the, under the library, we have um, the bibliographies that I was mentioning. We, you can click here and our librarians have created sort of a, a resource where you can view a bibliography of Puerto Rican studies. Um, so if you're just looking for, for readings for, for, for your students, you can uh, navigate this bar over here. And if you're looking for something about social conditions or education or veterans in the military, urban planning, entertainment, um, if you want to, you know, more information about the Puerto Rican flag, you can click there and you'll have a link to all these different resources, articles about uh, the Puerto Rican flag. And that's something that our, you know, our library and our library staff have put together. Um, and then, of course, we have, uh, you, can, you can see our film and video collections here with uh, a, a document that has over a list of over 600 films that we have available and that we do provide on loan. And we have our policy here. And again, more than happy to, to ship any of those materials um, to Connecticut. Um, and then we have um, uh, newspapers and journals. These are the microfilm collections uh, for a lot of early um, Puerto Rican publications. Uh, and also um, El Diario, which was a, a major publication a major newspaper uh, for Puerto Rican culture um, in New York City. And then if you look at our research and education, we have uh, free downloadable PDFs on a variety of topics, including um, demographics, uh, voting information, um, and uh, general information about uh, Puerto Rican recovery after Hurricane Maria. These are all PDF documents that can be downloaded and used for a variety of different uh, topics. Uh, we have one specifically on Puerto Rican decline and school closure in Puerto Rico, which was a major issue 
um, after um, the earthquakes, especially many schools were closed and they were not reopened. Uh, and we have many uh, report briefs on um, Hurricane Maria. And then in our education section, uh, there's information about the cultural ambassadors program and how you can register for the program and get uh, free educational content, um, free educational modules um, and download posters um, that you, and documentaries that you can use for your courses. The different uh, coursework is, a lot, many of them are based off of the, the content that I've mentioned previously, content from our archives. So history of Puerto Ricans in the United States, history and culture of Puerto Ricans in New York City. And if you click there, it's a, a fairly comprehensive um, curriculum that we've developed here uh, uh, over seven parts. As produced by uh, Virginia Sanchez Corol, who's a, a, a giant in the, in the field of Puerto Rican studies. And again, the, this is all available on our website and all available free of charge um, at any time. And there are teaching guides um, to all these different units. Um, it's up to you to decide whether or not it's something that is uh, uh, age appropriate uh, for, for the group that you're working with. And then in terms of our digital archives, since people can't come in and use our physical archives at the moment, uh, if you click here, you go to our digital collections page. And our digital collections page is where you get to interact with primary source documents directly from home. And you can browse by my favorite function is the browse function, or if there's a specific topic that you're looking for, you can also do a search. And we have featured galleries. Um, for instance, um, I had mentioned one about uh, these, these two are equally great. So I think well, I, I can show you both of them. The Boricuas Hawaiianas is about Puerto Rican settlement in Hawaii. And again, you can see how you, you know, you, if unless someone told you it was Hawaii, you wouldn't really know. It looks like Puerto Ricans sort of it took their entire culture and transplanted it over to Hawaii. It's actually quite, quite endearing. And, and sort of one of the things that gives you pride as a Puerto Rican person is, is how our culture is, is so strong that it can, it can survive all of this hardship and thousands of miles. And um, yes, yeah, so you, get, you can see uh, images of people, laborers and in the fields and uh, Images of people just hanging out and playing El Cuatro uh, and with their home in the background. Um, and it's, it's, it's just a, a nice insight into, into a, a different aspect of Puerto Rican culture that not many people know about. You know, uh, many of my family members had no idea that there was such a prominent history of Puerto Ricans in, in Hawaii. Um, and then the other one uh, that I want to show you was the, the one on steamships and uh, Puerto Rican steamship travel. Um, and the reason Puerto Rican steamship travel stopped so abruptly after World War II was that the steamships were used uh, by the military and they were subsequently destroyed uh, by, um, by the Nazis. Um, so you get to see um, some resources. This, was, this, was, this, uh, this gallery accompanied, this was the donor of the materials. This, uh, we had a physical um, gallery in our reading room where we displayed a lot of these artifacts and these documents. And you get to see all of the advertisements. And uh, all the tried things that they tried to entice Puerto Ricans to go to the big city. And you get to see the the Borinquen ship. And, um, and if your student, you know, your students, you know, one of the questions that your students might ask is, you know, why is it sometimes referred to as Puerto Rico and then why is it sometimes referred to as Puerto Rico? So um, I'm not gonna give you guys the answer. I know the answer, but um, that's something that that would be an, an interesting topic. It's, it's, it's a, a very political question that has a lot to do with Puerto Rican self-determination. Uh, this was the, the Cuomo, that was the, the bisection of the Cuomo ship. Uh, Puerto Rico as the tourist Mecca. Again, we, we, in, in the news recently, there have been uh, unfortunate accounts of how 
uh, tourists from the States have gone to Puerto Rico and been less than respectful. That's not something new. That's, that's been the case for a long time. Um, and of course, Puerto Rico has always been seen as a place for, for opportunity and commerce. Um, there's always been uh, a community of people that have migrated back and forth. And a lot of them use these steamships um, to go between Puerto Rico, Cuba, and um, New York Harbor. And you get to see the passenger lists. You get to see the things that people would do when they'd go to Puerto Rico, um, the, the itineraries for the, for the ships and the, and the uh, different rules and rates of passage. You didn't have to show ID, but you did have to pay, uh, pay for a ticket. Um, and all sorts of advertisements and, and street scenes. And, and honestly, I can go on and on, uh, but uh, I want to share uh, some of the, the browsers, the browsing, uh, uh, you can browse by uh, the title of a collection. You, drive, you can browse by an individual. There's a specific name that you're looking for by organization, by decade, place, or keyword. Uh, in terms of organization, if I wanted to look for, let's see, the Young Lords Party, which is a very popular topic. Um, let's see. Yankee Stadium is here. Yale University. There we go. There's another one right there. There you guys. You guys are famous in our archive. Um, young men. Young Lords. Here we go. So uh, we have a variety of different objects that are related to the Young Lords. Some of them are uh, interviews where people, you get to see oral history interviews where people talk about the subject of the Young Lords. And then the rest are, are different digital objects. And again, these are representations of things that we have in our actual physical archives that we've gone and, and, di and digitized and provided content for. And the great thing about this, this tool is that educators can can uh, go here and register for an account. And any of the content that you see, you can save to your account and then use it as a slideshow. Um, you would just click here and uh, use this little picture of a suitcase to save it to your account where you can download it. And uh, we also give you all of the preferred citation and additional informa information about all the digital objects as well. So that's a that's a, a little bit I wanted to share. Um, again, you know, we I can spend hours upon hours looking at all the wonderful different uh, resources that we have here, um, but I wanted to make sure I had an opportunity to answer any questions that people might have. Uh, there is uh, one question. Uh, um, an anonymous viewer asks if, uh, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, about the films and if any are, are available electronically. Um, we don't, unfortunately, at the moment, we, we don't have access to any electronic uh, films. A lot of the movies that we have are, are very hard to find. Um, and especially when, you, when you're when um, you discussing something as specific as the Puerto Rican studies. Um, yeah, and, and many, in many cases, they're digital transfers some like 16 millimeter film and, and, and things of that nature, where we have um, sort of reproduced it for preservation, but we don't have the rights to retransmit it as a digital file. I see. Is um is there do you have a newsletter or e magazine or something that uh, people in the audience, if they want to kind of find out what's what's happening, what's coming up, uh, that they can uh, kind of get a, a heads up? Definitely. Uh, under events and news, um, there's a calendar of events, and, and um, you can also sign up to our our newsletter. I believe it's at the bottom of the page here. Yeah, if you click your join central, okay. you'll you'll be signed up for our newsletter. Um, oh, this is interesting. I don't know why they put it all the way down here, but the central, the videos that you can use um, as part of the uh, curriculum, it's a, it's a, it's an award-winning. It won an I Imagen Award. Um, it's called Puerto Rican Voices, um, and it's about a variety of different topics. Um, Hundred Years of the Jones Act, uh, Aspira, Pennsylvania, the Borinqueneers, which is the 65th Infantry Division in World War II. Um, and I think we showed some of these to the students um, what last time you were you you visited with them. Um, I think so. Yeah, the, the, I think we showed them the the Borinquenia. Um, yes. 
Yeah. So these, these are all, again, all of these are free of charge. They're about 20 minutes long every episode. Um, and, and they're very fun and they're, the, the production values are very high. Um, and it's just another resource that, that Centra provides free of charge um, to educators. Well, to anyone really, but educators are our favorite people. So I know you don't have any now, but I'm feeling nostalgic uh, for live events. What kind of live events do you know? Did you used to back in the day put on, and and do you are you even thinking about opening yet? Um, so, uh, in terms of th thinking about opening, I, I'm thinking about opening every single day. Um, we we Hunter College is is putting plans into place um, to do a partial reopening, possibly by by late summer, um, with the idea is that that some staff will be allowed back on site in the fall. Um, so, you know, it, it all, it's all contingent on how this pandemic continues to play itself out and, and if people continue to get vaccinated and, 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 to, and you know, if, if our policymakers continue to do the right things. Right. Um, but in terms of the historical types of events that we've done, we've done authors round tables about um, book launches. Um, we've done uh, art, art gallery openings of different art exhibitions that we've held at Centro. Um, we, we had an extensive art program. Um, so we tried to do one different art installation every semester. Mm. Um, so we had um, just some different um, examples here that you can click through. And uh, we've, we've done film premieres for different documentaries that Centro has produced. Um, and, and uh, uh, we've held uh, conferences such as the Puerto Rico Puerto Ricans Conference, which were conferences that lasted over the course of uh, two days uh, about a variety of different topics, whether that's um, uh, economic policies in Puerto Rico, the newest uh, literature about citizenship in Puerto Rico, and, and we have uh, professors and um, other experts in the field talk about um, you know, those topics. Uh, you know, there's topics that range from art and uh, culture to, um, you know, the, quali the quality of the water and the air in the island after Hurricane Maria and that sort of thing. Um, though many of those uh, conferences are actually available on our YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Um, so let's see. And our YouTube channel is uh, Centro PR, and you can you can see a lot of those conferences in our in our YouTube page um, and, and the book talks as well. Um, but that's, that's the sort of general nature of, um, of the type of programming that we do at Centro. Um, and of course, one of, our, one of our favorite things to do is, is, is give um, tours and presentations like the one that you all received today of bibliographic instruction um, to students and to educators Pause that. Um, and you can see the different playlists that we have here and the uh, topics. Um, we like to give bibliographic instruction to on a variety of different topics. Um, and in many cases, we can work directly with um, educators if they share with us what their curriculum is and what the goals uh, are for the unit that they're working on. We can put together content that is uh, complementary to that. Um, and whether it's just something like a like a general overview, or it's something about um, you know the young lords, or something about um, the struggle for bilingual education, um, it, it really you know we can cater our, our resources to whatever the needs may be at the time. Yeah, these are great resources, and I'm really looking forward to uh, working with teachers to kind of think about ways that they can take these resources and transform them into dynamic classroom uh, experiences. Yeah, and you can see all, you can see the, the different Puerto Rican conferences that we have in symposia, roundtables, you know, workshops and, and events that are held here. Um, we, we tend to record the majority of them. Um, and I think uh, the, the one on um, that is tonight is also being recorded. Yes, yes, we'll have it uh, available. It's probably available as we speak on our, um, live Facebook. Uh, then, you know, I'm uh, curious, do you get uh, uh, people contacting you from Puerto Rico itself, like visiting 
uh, the archives, uh, asking questions and that sort? Is there a lot of traffic with the island? Absolutely. Um, although there is no one um, sort of prototypical uh, patron, um, okay. we do receive lots of research requests um, from people on the island. There is an, a growing desire to understand the diaspora experience. And Centro is, is by far the most comprehensive collection of material representing the Puerto Ricans in the diaspora. Um, so you have new young generations of scholars in Puerto Rico um, that want to know what that experience was like in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s for these uh, burgeoning Puerto Rican communities. Um, and we're beginning to see how all of this is cyclical because after Hurricane Maria, we had new waves of migration to uh, the Northeast, uh, to New York City, and you had young Puerto Rican families moving to the Bronx and moving to New York. Um, again, with the same struggles, you didn't, they, they might not speak the language, they have difficulty finding jobs, and, and you can draw parallels between the, these struggles that are happening in the 21st century and, and these communities that did the same thing in the 1940s and 50s. Yeah. Anibal, are there, um, is this the most concentrated center or are there other centers that you link up with? In terms of uh, strictly Puerto Rican studies, um, I would say that we're the most concentrated collection. There are other material, there are other collections of like L Latino studies and Dominican studies and Mexican yeah. studies that we have collaborated with in the past. Um, we have conferences, one, one, one such conference is called the Somos Conference. Um, and where, where all the ethnic studies organizations get together and, and sort of, you know, peddle their wares and discuss different topics that we're all experiencing. Um, but in terms of uh, the Puerto Rican studies, um, I would say that we're, we're the strongest collection that, that you can encounter there. And, and there are great collections out there as well at, at different universities. Um, but in terms of uh, the concentration of materials and, and the dedication to acquisition and circulation um, and reference work with um, these types of materials, uh, I, I reckon that Puerto Rico is, the, the, that Centro is probably the, the biggest name. Are there internships or um, scholarships for researchers who might want to spend a semester or two really working at the library? So we do we do provide opportunities for internships, um, and there are grants and fellowships that that Centro does um, to people that are that are interested. Um, so you can go to the grants and fellowships. Uh, page on our website, and you can apply for various programs. Um, the Frank Bonilla Fellowship Fund is independent, sort of independent research based. And then the Mellons Fellow uh, program is it's a little more strict in terms of who can apply and, and what the different um, uh, qualifications are. This one, I believe, is specifically for doctoral students. Right. But um, in, in terms, in, in general, if if uh, we receive lots of requests for to, for people who want to do like library students and and just members of the community who want to do volunteer work, um, mm -hmm. and or just want to be in a library and work in a library just for either for credit or or just out of the goodness of their own heart, and and we always you know um, we always consider that as well. Well, I I want to thank both of you for. Uh, a real, uh, a real great evening. I guess it's evening to me. I'm old, uh, but uh, it's been great uh, having both of you, Marta, Anibal. Um, I don't know if we said it uh, before we went live or not, but uh, at, at the first available possible moment, we need to get together in New Haven and um, start scheming about what we're going to do next. Absolutely, and I'm going to put my my email address uh, down again in case um, uh, I'll put this 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 uh, slide up um, again. It, please reach out to me um, as often as you'd like. Um, we're constantly receiving requests uh, for people that want access to journal articles um, that people just that, that might not have any idea of where to begin. Um, we can provide sort of that primer material um, so you, so you can get a, a your foot in. Uh, in terms of just starting with the Puerto Rican studies. Um, as, and our, the strengths of our collection, again, are, are representations of Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, 
Uh, but if you have students that are interested in, you know, pre, you know, uh, pre-Columbian culture, uh, the Taino people, uh, myths and folklore, um, those are also uh, subjects that are well represented within our collection. Fantastic. And the best way to get together and talk about these kinds of interesting things is around the table with pernil and rice and beans. Of course. Right. Actually, we may need to just go down to New York because I think they have better. Excellent, <laughs> Thomas, I'm there. Yeah. All right, okay. You can count uh, on me. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Marta, Anibal. It's been really a lovely yeah. evening. Thank you, Anibal. This is wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, when, when Tom reached out to me regarding uh, my participation, uh, you know, I was an easy yes. So I, I definitely <laughs> wanted to be a part of this. And, wow. uh, and any opportunity I have to, to share um, the resources that we have at Centro, it's an absolute pleasure for me. This has yeah. been just so eye-opening. It's been wonderful, hasn't it? It's been really yeah. wonderful. Thank you, Anibal. I hope our paths cross again soon, very soon. Well, certainly. I have no I'll doubt that it will. Well. And yes, all of you out there, thanks so much for being a part of this. And, uh, and tune in again. <laughs>